that serious commitment to making sure this thing is legit. It makes sense, though, when you think about it. I mean, we're talking about a test used in over 150 countries for university admission. This is the TOEFL Speaking Prep podcast for the AI era. Okay, so uh, let's jump right in. We're tackling something today that I know a lot of people, uh, well, let's just say it can be a little intimidating. Yeah, I hear you. I think I know where you're going with this. We talked about standardized tests. You got it. Specifically, we're doing a deep dive on the TOEFL IBT. Ah, the TOEFL. Now, that's a name that brings back uh, memories for a lot of us, hopefully good ones. Right. So I've been digging into this research you shared, TOEFL IBT test framework and test development. And honestly, it kind of changed how I see these kinds of tests. Really? How so? Well, I always figured, you know, big standardized tests, probably just like a bunch of questions they throw together. But this document, it really digs into all the research and the thinking that goes into making the TOEFL actually reflect what you need for, you know, succeeding in English, academically speaking. Yeah, it's really impressive the lengths they go to. I mean, did you catch that part about them having over 300, literally 300 research reports backing up how the test is designed? 300. No joke. That serious commitment to making sure this thing is legit. It makes sense, though, when you think about it. I mean, we're talking about a test used in over 150 countries for university admissions. It's kind of a big deal. Huge. This isn't just some, you know, pass or fail kind of thing. Yeah. It's about showing you can actually cut it in a demanding academic environment. Speaking of which, they have this whole thing called, and it sounds kind of jargony, but it's called evidence-centered design. Evidence-centered design. <laughs> okay, I got to admit, that does sound a little intimidating. Right. But it's actually pretty cool when you break it down. Think of it like, say, building a house. Yeah. You would just start randomly slapping bricks together, right? Hopefully not. Exactly. Everything's planned out. Every material is chosen for a reason. So with the TOEFL, it's the same idea. Every reading passage, every listening clip, those speaking prompts, it's all carefully chosen to measure very specific skills you need in academics. So it's not just about knowing grammar rules. It's about actually using the language in real life situations, or at least as close as you can get in a testing environment, I guess. Exactly. And get this. To make sure they're really capturing those real-world situations, they have this super diverse team of people developing the test. We're talking people who've taught English all over the world. Wow, okay, I didn't realize that, but it makes sense. Right, I mean, to make the TOEFL truly global, you need that insider perspective. And especially because a lot of those test developers, they learned English as a second language themselves. Oh, wow. Okay. Now that is a really cool detail. Like you said, who better to design a test like this than people who've actually been through that whole language learning journey? Exactly. And speaking of making sure things are fair, that's another area where they really, I mean, they really go all out. Yeah, let's definitely dig into that because honestly, I think we can all agree taking the TOEFL, those are some high stakes. It can be life changing getting those scores. So how do they make sure it's a level playing field for everybody taking the test? Well, they have this system and I'm not kidding. They call it the fairness challenge. Fairness challenge. OK, see, now that's just a cool name for something. I mean, it sounds kind of like almost aggressive, right? Like they're like hunting down unfairness in the test. It's a pretty good way to put it, actually. Yeah. It's like this built in system to catch any potential problems even before they become problems. OK, so walk me through it. How does this this fairness challenge actually work in practice? Who's yeah. doing the challenging? So they have these specially trained fairness reviewers, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of them come from fields like, you know, linguistics, education, cultural studies, people who really get how language and culture intersect. OK, so they've got the right people for the job. So what are these reviewers actually like doing? What are they looking for? Basically, they're going through each question with a fine-toothed comb. They're asking questions like, could this be misinterpreted by someone from a different cultural background? Does this question give an unfair advantage to native English speakers? It's really impressive the level of detail they go into. That's really cool, actually. I mean, it makes sense, but I never thought about it that way. It's like I've got this whole team dedicated to being, like, biased detectives. Exactly. They're trying to eliminate any chance yeah. of unfairness, which I think is really important. Absolutely. But OK, I got to ask, there's one thing I've always wondered about these kinds of tests, especially when you get into the speaking and writing sections. How do you grade that fairly? I mean, it's not like math where there's just one right answer, you know? Yeah, that's the million dollar question in language assessment, right? Subjectivity. But here's the thing. 
Even though speaking and writing involve some level of subjectivity, ETS has gone to great lengths to make it as objective and consistent as possible. And they do that through these super detailed scoring rubrics. Scoring rubrics. Okay, so what are they looking for in those rubrics? Like what makes a good speaking or writing response in their eyes? Sure. So it's not just about like perfect grammar or using fancy vocabulary, although those things matter too. They're also looking at things like coherence, how well you organize your ideas, and fluency, how smoothly you express yourself. And of course, pronunciation, whether your speech is clear and understandable. So it's more about communication, like actually getting your point across effectively, not just showing off how much you know. Exactly. It's about demonstrating that you can actually use the language to communicate in real world situations. And to make sure everyone's graded fairly, they have multiple trained raters look at each speaking and writing response. Smart. So you're not just relying on one person's opinion. I like that. Exactly. And hold on, it gets even cooler. They also use this thing called the E-Rater system for the writing section. The E-Rater? Is that like a some kind of robot that grades your essays? Well, it is AI powered, but it's not about replacing human judgment entirely. Think of it more like an extra layer of quality control. It helps ensure consistency in scoring, but there are still highly trained human raters involved in every step of the way. Okay, so it's like a team effort, technology, and humans working together. I can dig that. But yeah. hold on, going back to the human raters for a second, because this is something else that really blew my mind when I read it. They actually train non-native English speakers to be raters. Yeah, isn't that cool? When you think about it, it makes so much sense. Who better to assess English proficiency than someone who's been through the process of learning the language themselves? Seriously, talk about insider knowledge. They've been there, done that, right? They get it. Right. And it goes back to what we were saying before about making the TOEFL globally relevant. Having that diversity among their raters helps ensure fairness across cultures. It's really impressive. I'm with you on that one. This whole thing is way more complex than I ever realized. But OK, last question before we move on. What happens after someone takes the TOEFL? Like, do they just get their score and that's it? Nope, not even close. And this is where it gets really interesting from a research perspective. So we've been talking about like all the work that goes into actually making the TOEFL, right? All the fairness checks, the different perspectives, it's a lot. But then what happens after the test is done? That's gotta be interesting too, right? Oh, absolutely. It doesn't just end there. This is where the item analysis comes in. It's kind of like, um, you know how sports teams do those post-game analyses? Mm -hmm. It's like that, but for every single question on the TOEFL. Okay, I like where you're going with this. So what are they analyzing about each question? Like, what are they looking for in this uh, in this post-game review? So basically, they look at how every single question performed. Like, did most test takers get it right? Or were there a lot of people who missed it? Did people from different language backgrounds answer it in different ways? Stuff like that. Interesting. So it's not just about seeing who passed or failed. It's about making sure each question is actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. Exactly. It's about constantly checking to see if the questions are actually measuring what they're supposed to measure. Like, if a question is too hard or even too easy, they might revise it or even get rid of it entirely for future tests. Wow. So they're always tweaking and improving things based on the data. That's actually kind of reassuring, you know, makes it feel less, I don't know, arbitrary, I guess. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah. It shows a real commitment to making the TOEFL the best it can be, both in terms of fairness and how well it actually measures English proficiency, which, let's be honest, not all standardized tests can say the same. Yeah, no kidding. It makes you wonder what goes on behind the scenes of some of those other tests, huh? But, okay, this has been seriously eye-opening. I always thought of the TOEFL as this big, mysterious exam, but now I kind of see it differently. Me too. I mean, it's still a challenging test, but now we know there's a ton of thought and research behind it, which is reassuring for both the people taking it and the institutions using it to make decisions. 100%. Well, folks, there you have it. That was our deep dive into the TOEFL IBT. Hopefully this gave you a little peek behind the curtain, showed you what makes this test tick. Remember, the next time you encounter ANY standardized tests, don't be afraid to ask some questions, do some digging. You might be surprised by what you find.